you are part of a tradition of service that stretches back nearly 100 years. Doughboys marched off to World War I from this facility. You trained our soldiers for World War II, Korea, Vietnam. For 100 years, the service members and civilians of Fort Lee, Virginia, have served in the defense of the nation. From its early days of training ground troops for fighting in France during World War I to training logistics personnel to maintain the warfighter during World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, today's Fort Lee is the Army's premier learning institution for logistics leaders. Home to the U.S. Army sustainment think tank, Fort Lee delivers game-changing leaders and sustainment solutions to support the defense of the nation. But in the early days of the installation, sustainment wasn't the name of the game. Winning a war to end all wars was. Uh, April of 1917, when the U.S. declared war on Germany, uh, the Army went through a tremendous mobilization effort. Uh, part of that effort was the um, establishment of 32 training camps for the mobilized National Guard divisions and the new draftee National Army divisions. Camp Lee was established here outside of Petersburg to support the training of the 80th Division, the Blue Ridge, which was a uh, National Army division. So Camp Lee's initial establishment in June of 1917 was to support the training of an infantry division that was scheduled to deploy to France. Within weeks of the April 6, 1917 U.S. declaration of war on Germany, the War Department acquired a substantial tract of farmland in Prince George County, Virginia. Construction on the camp began June 10, 1917. On July 15, the War Department announced that the camp would be named in honor of General Robert E. Lee, the most famous of the Confederate Civil War commanders and a native Virginian. Also in 1917, the Construction Division decided that all military posts south of the Mason-Dixon line would be named after Confederate generals and those north and west after um, uh, Union generals, essentially as a recruiting tool. When America entered World War I, the nation was swept by patriotism and young men, including many from the local area, rushed to join up for the chance to join in the fight against Germany. Within 60 days, some 14,000 men were on the new installation. By September, a little over three months after construction began, more than 1,500 buildings and over 15 miles of on-post roads had been constructed. Camp Lee was one of the largest of the National Army cantonments constructed with the capacity to house and train over 60,000 volunteers. Soon, members of the 80th Division, the Blue Ridge Boys, comprised of draftees from Pennsylvania, Virginia and West Virginia began arriving. Before long, Camp Lee became one of the largest cities in Virginia. The camp was only surpassed in population by Richmond and Norfolk. More than 60,000 doughboys trained here prior to their departure for the Western Front and fighting in France and Germany. Music played an important role in the life of Camp Lee. Each regiment had a band, such as the 62nd Infantry Regimental Band. Even the base hospital had its own band. Bands provided music for parades and reviews and played concerts for soldiers and the local community, a tradition that the 392nd Army Band continues to this day. More than 400,000 African Americans served in World War I with a sizable contingent assigned to Camp Lee. The majority of black soldiers were in the services of supply, quartermaster, stevedore, and pioneer infantry units virtually all of them segregated. When not on duty, the soldiers enjoyed a variety of recreational options. In 1918, a soldier wrote his sister to assure her that he was doing fine at Camp Lee. You can get all the writing paper and envelopes you want at the Knights of Columbus or the YMCA, and all the time there is something going on at the YMCA. You can see some good movie picture shows and some boxing and is all for free for Uncle's Boys. Camp Lee served as a demobilization center from 1919 to 1921. In 1921, the camp was formally closed and its buildings were torn down, except for the White House. During the war, this two-story frame structure had served as the 80th Division headquarters 
and as a temporary residence for its commander, Major General Adelbert Cronkite. Years later, it became known as the Davis House, in honor of the family who lived there in the 1930s and 40s. Except for the Davis House, which is still in use today, and in handful of overgrown training trenches, there are no other visible signs of all the training and other activities that took place here during World War I. During the interwar years, the Camp Lee property reverted to the Commonwealth of Virginia. A portion of the land going to Petersburg National Battlefield and the rest used to create a Virginia State Game Preserve. With the onset of World War II in 1939, the Army again returned to the area and in 1940 reestablished Camp Lee, uh, basically another construction almost identical to those uh, that were done here in World War I, about 15,000 wooden barracks and buildings. Um, and it became the home of the Quartermaster Training Center uh, and the Quartermaster School, which was up in Philadelphia, was moved down here in February of 1941. Camp Lee became the home of the Quartermaster Replacement Training Center. The Quartermaster School, a Women's Army Auxiliary Corps detachment, a 1,000 bed regional hospital, a major army reception center, and even a prisoner of war camp. Quartermaster was basically responsible for everything troop support. It could be typewriter repair, it could be clothing repair, it could be what we call, then called graves registration, baking and food service and cooks were a big deal, especially the baking. After induction, new recruits were introduced to military discipline and courtesy. They were instructed on such things as drill, ceremony, first aid, military sanitation and hygiene, and the care of clothing and equipment. The technical service section of the Quartermaster School produced a large array of models, graphic illustrations, sand table exhibits, and other training aids to help with the teaching of technical courses. Training films were produced by the Technical Service Division with the cooperation of the U.S. Army Signal Corps. The widespread use of material handling equipment, forklift trucks and pallets, trailers, tractors, and conveyors was the most significant development in supply operations during World War II. A simulated rail line, the Camp Lee Berlin Tokyo Railroad Line, never actually delivered the military vehicles and ammunition needed to blow the Axis powers all to Hades. But the system gave the Quartermaster School students a practical idea of how supplies were to be moved by rail. During the course of World War II, nearly 25,000 soldiers graduated from the Quartermaster Officer Candidate School and were commissioned as second lieutenants. Both enlisted and officer female soldiers began arriving at Camp Lee in mid-1942. A Women's Army Auxiliary Corps detachment was activated at the Quartermaster School in June 1943. By 1944, there were nearly 200 women assigned to Camp Lee. In 1948, the Women's Army Corps Training Center was established at Camp Lee. The WAC had served with distinction and commitment in World War II, convincing the Army's leadership of the importance of women serving in the Army. Camp Lee and its headquarters um, requested a WAC detachment to be put here at Camp Lee in order to support their mission. And so a WAC detachment of about 200 women, 47th Post Headquarters Women's Army Auxiliary Corps um, detachment was established here. Um, so they worked in support of everything that was being done in the garrison, anything that was being done having to do with training, of course as well as the hospital work, because of course there were Army nurses assigned to the ho Army hospital here as well. And that really established a link um, that would continue on well into the, into the 40s, 50s, and 60s later on. Um, in 1943, that Women's Army Auxiliary Corps becomes the Women's Army Corps. And really that just changed the status of women. The WAC Training Center continued at Fort Lee from 1948 to 1954. During World War II, Camp Lee served as the Army's Quartermaster Training Center, but unlike after World War I, remained operational after the war. In 1948, the first permanent building was built on Fort Lee, the Post Theater, which is still used as a theater today. In April 1950, 
the Army elected to grant Camp Lee permanence by renaming it Fort Lee, recognizing the importance of professionally trained logisticians to the battlefield success of the Army. When the Korean War erupted in June 1950, the training load at Fort Lee quickly accelerated to meet the sudden need for logistic support personnel in the Far East. The population of the Quartermaster School continued to grow at a rapid pace through 1951 and 1952. It was during this period that training and the primary Quartermaster functions were consolidated at Fort Lee. The aerial supply and parachute rigging mission for the Army became a Quartermaster School responsibility in 1950. In May 1951, the first rigger school was established at Fort Lee. Beginning with the Korean War, Quartermasters have rigged supplies and personal parachutes for the Army. Here, trainees learn the rigger motto, I will be sure always. Before graduating, each student is required to jump with a parachute they have packed themselves. The Aerial Delivery and Field Service Department conducts critical training in the techniques of aerial delivery and the important field laundry and bath service mission at their world-class training facility dedicated in 2005. Quartermaster Petroleum Training was relocated from Caven Point, New Jersey to Fort Lee in 1954. In the years following, the course of instruction has included aircraft refueling and the use of a variety of fuel sources. In 1983, the Army's water purification mission was given to the Quartermaster Corps. Using reverse osmosis water purification systems, Quartermaster water specialists can produce potable drinking water from any water source. Quartermaster cooks were historically trained at Army cooking schools around the country, but by the end of World War II, instruction was becoming centralized at Fort Lee. Soldiers were trained to cook in both garrison mess hall kitchens and field kitchens, and classes included WAC trainees. Today, at Fort Lee's Joint Culinary Center of Excellence, culinary specialists from all branches of the service receive comprehensive training in all aspects of culinary arts. Quartermaster operations extend to caring for service members killed in the line of duty. Originally, Quartermaster Graves registration trainees learned identification and removal procedures to recover remains from the battlefield. They also learned the proper way to perform burial ceremonies in the field. Today, this mission is known as Mortuary Affairs, and service members from across the Department of Defense are trained at the Joint Mortuary Affairs Center and this most sensitive of occupational specialties. To this day, Quartermaster Mortuary Affairs Specialists carry on the mission of recovering, identifying, and processing the remains of soldiers killed in action. In 1954, the Army Logistics Management College was established as a supply management course taught by the Quartermaster School at Fort Lee but evolved into a school of advanced learning for logisticians from all branches of the armed forces as well as international students. Accredited by the United States Department of Education, ALMAC graduated several thousand students a year. In 2009, ALMAC became Army Logistics University and moved into a new facility, Heiser Hall. The replacement for the Army Logistics Management College, ALU, a 400,000 square foot facility now offers more than 200 courses and trains more than 2,300 military and civilian students daily. Today, ALU encompasses the basic officer's leaders course for quartermaster, transportation and ordnance lieutenants, the logistic branch captain's career course, both basic and advanced warrant officer courses and one of the Army's largest non-commissioned officer academies. In 1959, at the height of the Cold War, Fort Lee served as a location for a major part of the Washington Air Defense Sector called the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment, or SAGE. SAGE was an information gathering station designed to analyze radar data 
collected from a nationwide network of facilities. The system was composed of two massive computers, the largest in the world, each containing 50,000 electronic tubes. The computers were housed in a four-story building made of 18-inch blast-resistant reinforced concrete that was designed to withstand a nuclear attack. Today, the building is called simply the Blockhouse and is home to the CECOM Software Engineer Center. The 1960s witnessed continued growth at Fort Lee, and in 1961, the Quartermaster School received a major addition when Mifflin Hall was built. Named after Thomas Mifflin, the Army's first Quartermaster General, the building contained classrooms, multimedia rooms, a library, cafeteria, and the administrative offices of the school. During the Army's buildup for the Vietnam War, this facility became the focal point for quartermaster training. In response to the need for quartermaster officers, the school reopened its officer's candidate school for the first time since World War II. Nearly 2,000 newly commissioned quartermaster second lieutenants graduated from OCS between 1966 and 1968. From its earliest days, Army medicine has played a prominent role in the history of Fort Lee. The original base hospital, constructed in 1917, was a complex of more than 40 buildings staffed by over 1,000 doctors, nurses, and enlisted medical specialists. The hospital's greatest challenge came during the 1918 Spanish influenza epidemic that saw the hospital inundated with over 9,000 flu cases, of whom 700 died, including 26 hospital personnel. During World War II, the base hospital was rebuilt along with the rest of Camp Lee and played an equally prominent role as a regional medical center through the 1950s. Construction on a new hospital began in 1960 and was fully completed in 1962. It was named for Major General Albert W. Kenner, General Dwight D. Eisenhower's chief medical officer in World War II. Kenner Army Health Clinic continues to provide the Fort Lee local community with first-class medical care. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, Fort Lee continued to be the center for logistics training in the Army. In 1990, soldiers from Fort Lee deployed to Southwest Asia to support Operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Fort Lee also served as an in-processing center for reserve units deployed to the war and as a site where quartermaster units received additional training prior to their departure to the Gulf. In 1990, the Army Logistics Center at Fort Lee and the Soldier Support Center at Fort Benjamin Harrison merged to form the new Combined Armed Support Command at Fort Lee. CASCOM is charged with coordinating sustainment doctrine and developing new equipment for all sustainment branches of the Army, including Quartermaster, Transportation, Ordnance, Adjutant General, and Finance. Today, CASCOM's mission includes the training of more than 100,000 service members and civilians a year at over 70 training locations throughout the world, and executing capability development for over 400 programs. In keeping with its mission of training and educating soldiers, Fort Lee is blessed with outstanding museums. Since 1957, the Quartermaster Museum has preserved the history and heritage of the U.S. Army Quartermaster Corps, the Army's oldest logistics branch. On display are artifacts depicting the history of the Quartermaster Corps from its inception to the Corps' most recent missions. The Army's Women's Museum is the only one of its type in the Department of Defense. Out of all the five branches of the military, the Army is the only branch to have a museum such as this. So it's quite a, a proud history. In part, the reason for that is because it originated as the Women's Army Corps Museum at Fort McClellan, Alabama in 1955. So when it was decided that Fort McClellan, Alabama was to be closed or bracked, um, the museum needed to be moved and so it was decided to move it here to Fort Lee in 2001. So we ended up with a new name and a new mission. We went from being the Women's Army Corps Museum to the United States Army Women's Museum. And instead of telling the history from 1942 to 1978, we now go from 1775 to present. 
So we like to say here that this is not only women's history, but it's also Army history, and therefore it's our nation's history as well. Under construction is a state-of-the-art training and support facility that will provide ordnance soldiers with an unparalleled opportunity to learn the history of their branch through artifacts and exhibits. In addition to the Army, Fort Lee is home to a number of significant Defense Department organizations. In 1990, the Armed Forces Commissaries were consolidated into one organization called the Defense Commissary Agency, or DECA, with headquarters at Fort Lee. DECA is charged with managing nearly 300 Armed Forces Commissaries throughout the world for service members and their families, and procuring consumer items to building new commissaries and renovating existing ones. We're not in business to make a profit, we're in business to be a benefit. The Defense Contract Management Agency began operations at Fort Lee in 2011. Defense Contract Management Agency is an organization of about 12,000 people around the world, a thousand different locations. We have um, responsibility for almost 20,000 different contractors, over 300,000 contracts valued at over $2 trillion in contract value. It's a huge responsibility, but in the end, our key responsibility is making sure that whatever products are delivered to our warfighting customers meet the quality expectations that we all have. Fort Lee received a major boost when Congress passed its base realignment and closure legislation in 2005. Though initially slated for closure, Support from the local communities was instrumental in keeping Fort Lee open and gaining assets from other downsized bases. Out of a near tragedy sometimes comes you know, some wonderful things and out of Fort Lee getting very close to closing, uh, the community now that they fought to keep it open and were successful not only keeping it open but in a subsequent BRAC having this grow and, and almost double in size. The decision ignited a building boom as the fort had to prepare for the arrival of the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps from its facilities at Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland and Redstone Arsenal, Alabama, and the headquarters of the U.S. Army Transportation Center and School from Fort Eustis, Virginia. Planning began for the construction of new classroom buildings, headquarters administrative areas, dining facilities, barracks for students, and housing for military families. The centerpiece of the overall project was the $50 million Combined Armed Support Command Headquarters Building. In the summer of 2007, there was a groundbreaking ceremony on Sergeant Say Field, the site of the new facility. The Combined Armed Support Command Headquarters took 18 months to build and was formally dedicated in January 2009. It now houses the Combined Armed Support Command and the command groups for the Quartermaster, Ordnance, and Transportation Corps. The colors of the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps were uncased at Fort Lee on September 11, 2009. A subsequent ceremony two years later, September 15, 2011, heralded the completion of the all-new Ordnance Campus on the north side of Fort Lee. This complex reflects the Army's vision of ultra-modern training and living facilities for 21st century sustainers. Having reached full operational status, the Ordnance Campus will have an average daily population of 5,000, including students, faculty, and administrative personnel. Ordnance isn't just behind the lines in today's warfare. Ordnance is in the lines. And actually, there's been evidence of that going back to World War II and World War I. Or, uh, their mission may be different than a combat soldier or officer, but they're going to be there. The Ordnance School is responsible for maintenance, ammunition, and explosive ordnance disposal providing a full spectrum of capabilities enabling Army readiness. Annually, the Ordnance School directly trains over 30,000 soldiers, civilians, and members of other services and nations, and is responsible for the training of over 100,000 Department of the Army civilians through distance learning. Fort Lee marked the arrival of the U.S. Army Transportation Corps and School on August 18, 2010. Transportation is responsible for the movement of personnel and material by truck, rail, air, and sea, providing a full spectrum of capabilities enabling Army readiness. Annually, the Transportation School directly trains 
over 17,000 soldiers, civilians, and members of other services and nations. If nothing, nothing happens if nothing moves. I mean, when you look at logistics as operations, transportation is the moving piece. Otherwise, it's just stuff sitting on the ground, okay? So transportation connects the dot. As a result of the combined BRAC construction projects completed in 2011, the installation acquired 6.5 million square feet of new facilities and about 70,000 troops now train at Fort Lee each year. Already proud of its illustrious past, Fort Lee looks forward to continuing its future as the third largest training center in the Army. You don't always get the glory, but the fact is America's Army and America's military could not project around the world, would not be the very best in the world if it were not for the best sustainment personnel in the world. Today, Fort Lee supports sustainment training for active duty, reserve, and Army National Guard soldiers, as well as sailors, airmen, and Marines. Support starts here at Fort Lee, and this is its story. Fort Lee, celebrating 100 years of service to the nation.